today, had enough yet? The DFA Daily to the 17th of April 2020. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. We're getting stronger reads on the damage being done by the virus, and it's not pretty. Everything is pointing towards a serious outcome. China's GDP was reported today and fell by 6.8%, according to official figures. The year-on-year -year drop for the first three months of the year was caused by the coronavirus and is the first time the Chinese economy has gone into negative territory since GDP records began three decades ago. This is the worst performance since at least 1992, when official releases of quarterly GDP started, missing the consensus forecast of a 6% drop. Factory output fell 1.1% in March, retail sales slid 15.8%, while investment decreased 16.1% in the first three months of the year. The sharp contraction underscores the pressure that Chinese policymakers face as they attempt to revive the economy without nullifying the efforts to contain the virus. The continued spread around the world also threatens to add fresh downward pressure on China's exporters in a feedback loop that could throw millions out of work. China's economy was forced into a paralysis in late January. The economy remained shuttered for most of February with factories and shops closed and workers stranded at home. The process of resuming business has been disappointingly slow and the return rate only inched up to around 90% at the end of March. To cushion the economic blow, China has unveiled a range of support measures although not on the scale of other nations. That included a 3.55 trillion yuan, or $502 billion, of low-cost funding provided to financial institutions, 1.29 trillion yuan in pre-approved local government special bonds, and 1.6 trillion yuan in cuts to various fees, taxes, and other things, according to the National Cabinet. The central government is also mulling other policies like raising the deficit to GDP ratio, issuing special sovereign bonds and increasing the local government special bond quota in order to fuel a faster economic recovery. And according to a recent article from a senior official, exports fell less than expected in March as production capacity was gradually restored. But economists warn bigger headwinds lie ahead as the rest of the world shuts down and external demand diminishes. China's markets held gains after the release as investors digested the data. But then are markets reading things aright? Well, Ambrose Evans Pritchard from the UK's The Telegraph says investors are repeating the mistake they made all through February and early March. They are again underestimating the immense economic shock of COVID. Can there be any parallel in market history to the surreal clash of narratives we saw this week, he said. Global bourses soared even as the International Monetary Fund painted a series of scenarios ranging from dire, the most violent slump since the Great Depression, to catastrophic, with all the potential chain reactions spelt out in its Global Financial Stability Report. And yet Goldman Sachs tells us that COVID-19 is under control and the worst is over. The number of new active cases looks to be peaking globally. Projections of cumulative fatalities and peak healthcare usage are coming down, it said. And from this breathtaking premise, he says, Wall Street's fashion leader argues that we should look through the great lockdown to sunlit uplands ahead, anticipating a further 8% rise in the S&P 500 index by the end of the year. We can disregard normal bear market rules. This time, we will avoid the textbook sequence of events in recessions. A swift crash, followed by a torrid buy-the-dip rebound, and then a slow downward grind over months as reality hits home, ending only in capitulation at far lower levels. Authorities have spared us such a fate by rescuing everything Immediately, the Fed and Congress have precluded the prospect of a complete economic collapse, it says. 
And he said, well, I agree that the $5 trillion of central bank QE, vast fiscal packages, equivalent to 10% of GDP in the US, and blanket guarantees have averted a disaster for now. They have, in a disjointed way, bought both time and given us a chance of emerging from this sudden global stop without irreparable damage to the productive system. What is surely wrong is to imagine that this pandemic is a one-off shock lasting three months or so, followed by an early release from lockdowns and a swift return to near normality. The first glimpses of antibody data, such as Denmark's tests on blood donors, shows that we are nowhere near the safe threshold of herd immunity. They confirm fears that the mortality rate is at least 1% of infections and that therefore no democracies can let the virus run its course without overwhelming their health services and destroying their political legitimacy. The proposed trade-off between lives and the economy is an illusion. The most certain way to turn this crisis into a depression is to give up too soon, as Spain is already doing and Donald Trump is also itching to do. We would end up in the worst of all worlds with multiple waves and another forced closure of the economy to invert a winter tsunami, requiring trillions more in fiscal relief. He says the only viable path is to contain the virus to drive the R0 transmission rate, the reproduction number that describes the intensity of an outbreak below one, and hold it down by East Asian means of testing, tracing and isolating as we shift from an acute phase to a chronic phase. We are not close to achieving this. We lack the testing infrastructure at scale, even in Germany, and little is being done to prepare the public for tracking surveillance. We need a vaccine. Until we get one, the stock markets are in cloud cuckoo land, says Professor Anthony Costello from University College London. The IMF's most extreme scenario is all too plausible. It assumes the pandemic drags on with a second outbreak in 2021. This would cause output to contract by almost a tenth and set in motion a non-linear response of financial markets, fund parlance for defaults and panic. Public debt ratios would jump by 20 percentage points of GDP. The shock would push Italy's debt above 125% of GDP. Ratios would rise to 155% in Portugal and to 135% in Spain and France. And he said, in my view, such debt spirals among sub-sovereign borrowers would render monetary union dangerously unstable unless the EU faced up to its Hamiltonian moment and agreed to fiscal union. The evidence is that Europe is not about to do any such thing. Markets are assuming that Germany and its northern allies will grumble but will always allow the ECB to keep covering club med fiscal deficits, but assumptions are treacherous. The IMF prefers to dodge this minefield, but its stability report lists plenty of other weak links. For starters, emerging and frontier markets are facing the perfect storm. Currencies have buckled, Foreign funding has been cut off. Outflows are running at twice the pace of 2008. Median debt is almost 100% of GDP, much higher than before the Lehman crisis. Most lack the fiscal firepower to backstop their corporate systems and to cover lost wages. Global banks were supposed to be bulletproof after boosting capital ratios, but the regulatory buffers were never stress-tested for such a shock. They risk becoming the amplifier of the downturn as rising bad loans force them to pull back, starving the real economy of credit. Even if the worst is avoided and there is no secondary financial crisis, there will not be a swift return to normal. Mohammed El Arin from Alliance said, The rescue measures offer liquidity but cannot prevent the slow burn of defaults nor can they kick-start the economy when companies refuse to invest because they have no idea what is going to happen. The market has yet to grasp that we don't come out of this where we went in. Earnings are structurally damaged for years to come. Equities are not worth the same. Some 17 million have lost their job in three weeks and the great purge has yet to run its course. Global unemployment rates will explode to politically dangerous levels if the pandemic is not properly contained. 
the idea of V-shaped recovery was overly hopeful three weeks ago. Clinging to that position today borders on delusional. Or, as Bloomberg put it, with early signs Australia has successfully flattened the curve of infections, talk is turning to how soon the economy can start to reopen. Since Easter, the number of new cases has held below 50 a day, well down from the peak of 457 on March the 28th. That has had some executives calling for shuttered businesses to reopen, while people who have spent weeks at home are clamouring to get back to the beach, the pub or to the footy field. But relax too soon and we risk a resurgence in infections like in Hong Kong and Singapore. Initially lauded for efforts of keeping the virus under control, both cities have had to enforce more draconian curbs on daily life as a second wave of cases set in. In Singapore, wearing a mask is now mandatory for anyone venturing outdoors. Many individuals have been practicing social distancing by working from home in recent weeks. While this arrangement can be a great way to reduce one's exposure to COVID-19, it's a luxury that's available to just 29% of Americans. The situation for the remaining 71% is uncertain to say the least. A significant proportion of the population has lost their jobs due to the business shutdowns and mandated lockdown orders. Others employed in essential services have continued working as usual but may face a higher risk of potential exposure to the virus. But now the relative risk of exposure by occupation has been released by visual capitalist. Each occupation is scored by contact with others, physical proximity and exposure to disease and infection. And the bad news is that some roles have a much higher risk of exposure than others and not all of these are in the healthcare sector. But on average, services type jobs have higher risks, which is not good, given Australia's reliance on services. And the US Department of Labor reported that on the week ending the 11th of April, the advance figure for seasonally adjusted initial claims was 5,245,000, a decrease of 1,370,000 from the previous week's revised level. The previous week's level was revised up by 9,000 from 6,606,000 to 6,615,000. The full week moving average was 5.5 million, an increase of 1,200 from the previous week's revised average. And the previous week's average was revised up by 2,250 from 4.265 million to 4.267 million. And the Washington Post said that more than 22 million Americans have filed for unemployment and since President Trump declared a national emergency, a staggering loss of jobs that has wiped out a decade of employment gains and pushed families to line up at food banks as they await government help. The United States has not seen this level of job loss since the Great Depression and the government is struggling to respond fast enough to the virus, health crisis and the widespread economic pain it has triggered. Layoffs are mounting in nearly every sector as businesses have been forced to close in an effort to stem the spread of the virus. Many companies that remain open report a huge drop off in sales. New data showing manufacturing production cratered in March to the most since 1946 and new home construction saw the biggest decline in nearly 40 years. We are going to go through a couple of quarters at least where things will be bad, said Patrick Harker, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. I could see a jobless number hovering around or slightly below 20%. Even government aid has been slow to arrive for many Americans, exacerbating the downturn. The Small Business Administration stopped accepting loan applications on Thursday after it ran out of funds for a key program that is supposed to help businesses stay afloat and retain workers. And state unemployment offices are so overwhelmed that many people are still waiting for unemployment payments weeks later and few states have done anything yet for the self-employed and gig workers who are desperate for aid. Even the federal government's relief payments referred to by many as stimulus checks have been held up by various glitches. About half of the payments have gone out so far. Meantime, in Australia, as Reuters last week reported, bank losses may reach $25 to $27 billion per bank, 
and their capacity to pay dividends without raising equity materially has been diminished, Macquarie analysts were quoted as saying. And in the conversation, Richard Holdren, Professor of Economics at the University of New South Wales, discussed APRA's extraordinary letter sent to Australia's banks and insurers, essentially telling them to cut their dividend payments to shareholders in light of the crisis. It said it expected banks and insurers to seriously consider deferring decisions on the appropriate level of dividends, where a board was confident that it could approve a dividend on the basis of robust stress testing that had been discussed with APRA, it should nevertheless be at a materially reduced level. Where dividends were paid, those payments should be offset to the extent possible through the use of dividend investment plans and other capital management initiatives. The letter isn't a ban on dividends, and APRA wasn't telling the banks anything they didn't already know. So why did it bother, he asked. The answer lies in the economics of how investors react to firms that don't pay the dividends expected. Seen through that lens, APRA, he said, was very clever indeed. Discussing the so-called signalling theory of dividends, he said that the managers of firms would like to cut dividends in tough financial times, and probably should, but they worry about sending a bad signal to investors. An announcement like APRA's provides them with cover and excuse, and it does more. It is what economists refer to as a coordination device. If the big four banks got together and agreed together to cut their dividends by the same amount, say in half, which would be illegal, Investors would get no differential signal and no new information about which bank was good and which was bad. And they've an interest in coordinating. If one bank falls over during this crisis and needs to be bailed out, that's bad for all of them. All of their stock prices will tank and it will be hard for them to raise the capital they need to fund their operations. Australia's banks complete, but they are fremenies right now, more friends than enemies. And so Holden concluded, I've been critical of some of APRA's moves in recent years, but this one is brilliant. Let's hope the banks can see a life raft when they're offered one, he said. And in response to the regulator's statement, Westpac said that it has yet to make a decision regarding its interim dividend, while National Australia Bank said it would take APRA's guidance into account. Bank of Queensland said it would defer its dividend until the economic outlook is clearer and stress testing results have been discussed with APRA. And Citigroup earlier expected that without APRA's intervention, the big four may still cut dividends by as much as 18% in coming weeks due to the pandemic. And both the government and APRA have pressed super funds for quick early redemptions. The Morrison government has backed the prudential regulator's guidance given on Thursday, setting the expectation for superannuation funds to make the majority of early release payments to members within five days of being directed to by the tax office. APRA, along with ASIC, have both published answers to frequently asked questions about the responsibilities of superannuation trustees during the crisis. Among other things, the Prudential Watchdog indicated that Superannuation Industries Supervisionary Act requires a registrable superannuation entity licence to pay the benefit to the member as soon as practical after having received a copy of a determination from the ATO. The early super release measure which will commence from Monday, will allow individuals in financial distress to withdraw up to $10,000 from their super fund before July and a further $10,000 from July until September. As at a week ago, more than 600,000 fund members had registered their interest in the scheme, according to ATO data. A spokesperson for Industry Super Australia said funds were bracing themselves for a 4,000% yearly redemption swell. And APRA has the expectation that where automated checking was not identified a red flag, payments will be made for the majority of cases within five business days of instruction from the ATO. Payments may only take longer in exceptional cases, the regulator said, such as where there may be a potential red flag or potential fraud. The time frame may be slightly extended where an RSC licensee experiences a high volume of applications. An Assistant Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and Fintech, Jane Hume, has welcomed the recommended time frame. Given the importance of cash flow for many people at this critical time, the Morrison government expects super funds to be paying members their money as quickly as possible and within five days, 
Senator Hume said. We understand this is a very challenging time for all Australians. These measures will ensure that Australians impacted by the pandemic will receive this vital financial support as quickly as possible. And more forecasts about property price falls are coming thick and fast. Gareth Aird, the senior economist at CBA, says Australian capital city dwelling prices led by Sydney and Melbourne have risen strongly over the past nine months, but we expect that stellar run to end abruptly. The policy response to limit the spread of the virus has created a plunge in economic activity and unemployment will spike. This will have profound short-term consequences for the housing market. As a result, we have materially downwardly revised our expectations for Australian residential property prices. In our view, prices will fall sharply over the next six months. New lending is expected to contract. Buyer expectations have adjusted downwards from exuberance to pessimism. Rents are likely to fall. Auction clearance rates are expected to remain weak and turnover will be lower than usual. In addition, the usual underlying demand pulse from net overseas migration has evaporated because the border is shut. The net result means that price declines are inevitable. The extent to which prices fall will largely be determined by the magnitude of the lift in unemployment and the length of time that the government imposed restrictions on day-to-day activity remains in place. The forces are not all one way, they say. However, aggressive monetary policy easing has resulted in record low variable and fixed mortgage rates, which act as a support to dwelling prices. And debt relief via deferred home loan repayments for impacted households will mean less distressed sales arising from job losses than would have otherwise been the case. Our quantitative assessment of the residential market overlaid with our quality views means that we now expect national property prices to fall by around 10% over the next six months, i.e. 20% annualised. We would caution, however, that there is a great deal of uncertainty at present and there are scenarios where prices could fall by both more or less than we expect. Within the mix, there is likely to be variation in outcomes by capital city. More specifically, we expect Sydney and Melbourne to underperform relative to the national average. The New South Wales and Victorian economies have more exposure to the heavily impacted services sector and less exposure to some of the more insulated sectors like mining and agriculture. In addition, the Sydney and Melbourne housing markets are more reliant on strong population growth, particularly by immigration, to underpin demand. In summary, there are five reasons why dwelling prices will fall. Unemployment is rising very quickly. The household perception around prices has shifted dramatically. The rise in unemployment will put downward pressure on rents. Foreign investment in Australian property is likely to drop to close to zero during the enforced shutdown. And net overseas immigration has effectively dropped to zero because of the border being shut. And CoreLogic's head of research, Eliza Owen, has released research showing clear signs of a sharp slowdown in Australia's housing market. From a values perspective, the CoreLogic Hedonic Index has been showing a loss of momentum in housing value growth rates since mid-March. Data through to mid-April has seen a continuation in this trend, with the combined capital city measure slipping into negative territory week on week for the first time since early August last year. In addition, agents' listings have fallen. In 28 days to Easter Sunday 2020, the number of new residential listings advertised for sale across Australia was 24,051. This is by far the lowest level of listings for this time of year in years and is 27.3% below the equivalent period last year. And valuations have slumped but in some cases, this is a good sign. In the week ending the 12th of April, the total number of valuations ordered was down 24% over the week and 19.2% over the last year. In the same period, 75.3% of valuations ordered were for the purpose of loan refinancing, which suggests high volumes of borrowers looking to take advantage of record low interest rates. And residential construction will also be impacted by the virus. The combination of rising unemployment, falling dwelling prices and a halt to net overseas migration will see dwelling commencements slow significantly in 2020. So in summary, there are two issues that I want to leave you with today. The first is I think it is important that we consider seriously moving towards driving the virus down to zero. That is by far the best way to escape from the economic clutches that we are currently in at the moment. And secondly, because of the slowing economy, 
rising unemployment and those other factors, home prices will continue to fall. And as you know, my own predictions are that those falls could be somewhere between 50 and 35 to 40 percent, depending on how long this all goes on for. The sooner we get through it, the lower the falls will be. And just to remind you that next Tuesday, the 21st of April at 8 p.m. Sydney time, we'll be running our next live stream event and we'll be updating our models and talking about some of the issues from our modeling and surveys which will help to determine where our views run with regards to what's going to happen to home prices. Do feel free to join us or send a question in beforehand via the DFA blog. Link is below. And you can still ask a question live on the night via the YouTube chat. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.